Hey, cartoonists and cartoon lovers. Hello there. Welcome to a new episode of The Cartoon Pad. I am Bob Eckstein here with my co-host, Michael Shaw. Hi, Bob. And our showrunner, Marty. Hi, Marty. Hello. And every two weeks, we're going to talk shop about cartooning and discuss how the sausage is made. Many of you may be wondering, do we have segments? We have segments. We're going to be doing things like, what's on your fridge? Can this cartoon be saved? And writer's block. So, when we also book some special guests for the show, some so special I haven't even told you yet, Michael. Excellent use of dramatic silence there. I want to know now. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We have a guest for today, actually, and um, he'll be coming on soon. But uh, first, tell us, uh, how was your week? Uh, it was a week week, got to tell you the truth. I'm in Manitowoc and uh, I'm frozen. What are you working on now? I'm working on a cheeky Pinot Noir, the one with the barefoot on the box. It's delicious. Okay. I, I meant cartoon wise. Can you share with oh, us? Oh, cartoon wise. On? I'm drawing cartoon like objects. And when they finally become funny, they'll be a cartoon. But I am working on some Thurber forgery cartoons that I hope to sell at a high profit or at least use them on a secret project I'm working on. <laughs> That's true. Please, Bob, there's no room for falsehoods in this podcast. Are you excited about the podcast? Uh, so far, yeah, I'll let you know. All right. There's no pressure. As Marty, our trusted producer, said to me earlier, either you're this week's guest or your next week's co-host. As win. I say, you're either at the table or on the menu. Um, you know, I want to ask you, what do you thought of the name of the show? What do you think? Uh, I wanted... Dead? I wanted cartoon cornucopia, but uh, I, of course, get outvoted by the Hoy Polaroid. Cartoon copia. Cartoon copia? Well, that, make, that, <laughs> that makes no damn right. sense. You it's cartoon cornucopia. Uh, you can't have cartoons without corn. Come on. It was so Thanksgiving related. <laughs> uh, no, it's abundance. It's richness. It's thankfulness. Well, I wanted to do cartoonists and cards getting agita. Yeah, well, didn't Jerry send you that cease and desist letter? It's sort of lost to a lot of people if they don't know the reference. Uh, I so this is a good point because I'm going to make it later. So you're referencing something that you hope other people won't know you're making a reference to. Again, you're correct. Okay, good point. Because we are, there are no falsehoods in this podcast. Wow, they're setting the bar very high to begin with. I know, uh, like an impeachment. I, yeah, the other name I wanted to go with is car, cartoon talk. I like that. I mean, it steals from car talk, except you put a tune in the middle. Yeah, you know what? I was thinking that one of my favorite bands, Talk Talk, great band, horrible name. And no one even knows who they are because they have a lousy name, Talk Talk. Right. And I like the talking feet. Talk sort of them. And who knows how far the Beals would have gone with a better name? Little Feet. Remember Little Feet? Um, no, my feet are huge. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wasn't that an F? Yes. I, I don't, I've never heard them. Don't think. Dixie Chicken. Classic. Also, if it was cartoon talk, I was uh, I was looking forward to you telling how we could fix all the cartoons by replacing the carburetor. That's right. Let's see if it's getting gas. I know I am. Michael, do you listen to music while you do cartooning? Uh, yes, but there can be no words. Yeah, you know, I can understand that. I remember people saying that to me that, you know, they work with just classical music or opera, but no words. I have gotten into lo-fi. Anyone? Anyone else? Come on. Admit it. What is lo-fi? It's quirky. Like I, it's, it's like this ambient loopy music that just, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. It's like uh, music for the uh, 2020s. Is it like As, elevated music? No, it's yeah, sure. I can't describe it. They'll do some like with uh, Boris Johnson giving a speech and the music will be going through the loop as Boris Johnson is giving a speech. Oh, okay. Figure, 
it's it's cray. I'm telling you. And the ideas just pour out from there. Some pours out, but some of them are ideas. You know, bringing this up reminds me that I remember the great cartoonist Jack Ziegler. His favorite band, one of the favorite bands, was the Pixies. And oh, uh, that's yeah, that's that's too rambunctious for me. It is. I remember though, we, I went to his memorial at the Society of Illustration, and his daughter was telling me like she was getting chills because they had gone to the memorial to all go out and get a drink at a restaurant around the corner. And as they entered the restaurant, they were playing Monkey Goes to Heaven, which is a Pixie song. And she said that was her dad's favorite song. That's that's a little poignant for this podcast, but thank you for sharing. <laughs> we, we can recover. Okay. We'll be fine. Um, Michael, what is the most important uh, item in your cartoonist toolbox? Uh, like I said, that the box of Pinot. It's a beautiful thing. No, more important than that. More important than that. Well, let me scroll for a minute and let me think about it. It's, 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 what is it, Bob? Tell me. It's the right pen tip. With the uh, it's not a tip. Nib. It's a nib. I told you this. It's a nib. You with don't... the appropriate nib. Yes. Yes. Leave my nib out of this. Michael, quality what? nibs Bob. by Quib is a name cartoonists have trusted <laughs> over 60 years. It's old school, my friend. No recharging, no passwords. What size tip do you use? Uh, I told you, Bob. You know, it's not the size of your nib. It's what you do with it. My favorite nib is the double O. It's stiff and broad. How I like my drinks, if I drank. With Quib, you know you're in, seldom going to catch the page and have a pool of black ink. Destroy hours of hard work, 30 minutes before your deadline. Wow, Bob, you've convinced me. When I need a nib, I'm reaching for my Quib. Say, Bob, where can I find them? Wherever quality pen tips are sold. Quib coming up with those funny lines since 1962. Now back to Cartoon Pad. Thanks, Bob. Well, it's almost time for our first guest. But first, let me ask you, Michael. Yes, Bob. Seriously. Seriously, Bob. How does it feel being on the podcast? <laughs> it, 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 I, I'm frightened. I'm curious. And I'm enjoying it. I just have to remember to breathe and let it happen. I've done a, over 100 TV and radio appearances. And I can tell you that. Every single one, something goes wrong. So it, it, you're not supposed to be perfect. It's just, it's just the way it is. Well, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. And we're, <laughs> we're not perfect and we're not good. So, so far, so good. Uh, podcasts are like opinions. Everyone has them. That's okay. I'm going to think about that. that, that I disagree. Cartoon, that's a cartoon I did once. And um, <laughs> I did it for Mad Magazine. and then. Uh, it got seen somewhere, and I heard from uh, Greg Fitzsimmons, the comedian, and he has a podcast, and uh, he asked for that cartoon. So I I'd like a copy, wife. too, because I've never seen it, and I'll put it on my refrigerator. No, that, that's something for the segment. What's on your fridge? Okay, I jumped, I jumped the segment. I'm sorry. Can you think of a cartoon right now that you have as one of your favorites? Moi? Let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just reach for one, and it's going to be my favorite. Here's one I, I – uh, no, I don't like that one. Well, you're thinking. I'll, I'll say mine. Oh, you go. Yeah, I'll give one of mine. Um, well, you're up there with some of my favorite cartoons. And I know our guest coming up, he has some of my favorite cartoons ever. Um, he did a cartoon uh, for I think it was National Lampoon where a little kid on Christmas morning is coming into the living room and he spots Santa and Santa says uh, Timmy now I'm going to have to kill you oh that must be can I give away the guest that's yeah. a Nick Downs that is it is I love that cartoon you know, his work is troubling and sort of 
menacing. And I think that's why I like them so much. They kind of remind me of my cartoons. No, he's very good. He's uh, right now he's stuck in traffic. I, I think he's in a subway somewhere, but um, I remember seeing that cartoon when I was visiting Sam Gross and I walked into his apartment and I looked over to my left to hang up my coat and he had some original cartoons on the wall and there smack in the middle of this group of cartoons was that Nick Downs cartoon. Was it uh, the original? Yeah. Wow. And I think it was because Sam was the cartoon editor at the time at National Lampoon. Really? I didn't I didn't work for Sam then. I, I worked at National Lampoon later and I missed him. And then we became friends I, later. I think Marty could confirm this. Is this all true? Because we only deal in truths here on this podcast. 100 percent true. I, wow. I, I I'm just guessing, but sure. Well, uh, Bob, I, you know, one of your good friends, Larry Flint, died today. I just wanted to pass on my condolences. Yeah. yeah. A good I mean, friend of mine uh, was a staff cartoonist for his, for him, for Hustler for many years. And oh. he's the nicest guy in the world and created the most grotesque cartoons I ever saw in my life. And I said, why do you do that, Dan? And he said, Let's put two kids through college. So really, yes. you know, I see, I never really got into those cartoons too much. I mean, I worked for Playboy. Did you ever work for Playboy? That's I, I'm too young. I don't, don't remember Playboy. I'm sorry. Now, I did. I worked at Playboy before I had any interest in doing cartoons before I did any cartoons myself. I was a ghostwriter for a little Annie Fanny. <laughs> and I was brought in to, to punch up, the old cartoons because the guy who did them originally um bob geez, brown well i want to say the other guy um eisner who worked oh on and uh they did a great job i mean those guys were brilliant in the way they did the political undertones of that cartoon and um when i came in they had already left and the, that cartoon was abandoned but was very popular and they had the artwork for it but they didn't have like sort of the content so i came in and I tried to, to work there for a little while. And then at some point um, I was going to the Playboy parties. I went to a couple and that's when I first met Sam Gross and Leo Cullum. You guys were just hanging out in the pool, right? This was, this would have been like fifth Avenue party in Manhattan and all the, um, the waitresses and stuff were all dressed kind of, like uh, gaudy and, and, and sexy and everyone was wearing a tux and you wouldn't recognize anyone in the room necessarily. Like wasn't any real big celebrities, but this is sort of the New York city branch of playboy. So I didn't see like James Kahn in a hot tub. <laughs> I, I enjoy seeing that actually. So I'm glad I everyone, uh, there was a, a clamoring, for little Annie Fanny because of its political undertones. I would yeah, have never realized that. Yeah, they, no, they were, they were very like layered and stuff in the same way that little Abner was. And this is something that kind of went over my head, but little Abner was very political and was supposed to be like all these secret messages and all the cartoons and someone smarter could explain it for us now. But I did know that there was like way more to that cartoon as well. It also had the only edible cartoon character, the Shmoo, which was a va <laughs> vaguely phallic kind of weird thing that ran around and pointed its its little headless head at yeah, yeah. people. No, but that was like, wasn't that like jumping the shark? That was like when the Fonz jumped the shark. And this was like the Flintstones gazoo and like, uh, and that cousin <laughs> from the Brady Bunch who everyone had. Oh, Oliver. 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 I mean, sure. and that's. That's what you do when you really have like no more ideas and you just go to the back of the rack. Yeah. Um, I'll agree with that. I mean, little Abner was never one of my favorites. So it is fascinating. though. No, I love the Brady bunch. I'll, I'll just admit that. No, but it, it is fascinating. I think when things jump the shark, like, like Kramer versus Kramer versus Godzilla, like just that thing where they, you know, they just, Try to milk it for something. And I, and I, I think we just jumped something. <laughs> Not quite sure what.
listen, we're doing this podcast. I just spent a hundred bucks on a podcast microphone yesterday at Best Buy. We're going through with this. You would you would hope it had better words inside of it. It came with instructions in like every language. I'm not joking. Like everything from from every Asian language to like off this planet. I will say, but Bob, you are an expert at the podcast. How many podcasts have you been involved in? Um, let me think. Um, there's, uh, this is the first. Wow. Well, you're one ahead of me because I'm leaving. No, I've done have a podcast. And I, and I tell you what's helpful is when you're on something that's a total train wreck. I was thinking. Well, this, this morning, is good. <laughs> yeah, this is familiar. I feel better. I was on a, a podcast in Florida, and I won't mention the, the name of it, but the guy was having difficulty with the audio and like, making the connections, but he was live and didn't realize it. And he just let off a string of profanity as he was trying <laughs> to get it to work and stuff. And then he just changed gears and said, hello, Bob. It's great to have you here. What a lovely day we're having down here in Miami. After he just had like 30 seconds of like the worst, you know, a profanity laced tirade as his opener. <laughs> exactly. Um, but what I learned is that uh, this is something I enjoy doing. There's, there's name dropping, judging people, talking <laughs> about myself. Three things I enjoy doing. And so um, yeah, it should be fine. It's good. You've known a lot of people and you've been a lot of places. So I'm impressed. <laughs> you've been to... Strange sounding place. How does that go? Uh, strange sounding places with faraway names, like Bayonne. Someone, someone on some podcast said to me, "Name dropping is like sex. It's best done alone." <laughs> that's that's probably true. Well, um, we could start introducing our next guest and talk about him for a minute because he's not going to want to sit through this introduction. That's like one thing that's a pet peeve with Nick is that he hates long introductions. But I have one for him because he's very acclaimed and, and he deserves it. What do you say, showrunner? You think we could um... I think that's a great idea. And I think you yeah, should let's, uh, do let's a nice, Nick... long, lavish introduction for this distinguished first guest. Yeah, he's not on yet. So I'm going to go to this. Let's bring out our first guest. <laughs> And drag this up for 30 minutes. Here comes Mr. Bill's dog. He's what you would call a cartoonist cartoonist, responsible for some of the most iconic cartoons of our time, including the classics I mentioned earlier, where Santa tells Timmy, you're going to have to kill you now. And when the astronauts literally finding the cold, dead body of Alice Crandom on the moon in publications like Barron's, Wall Street Journal, American Bystander, National Lampoon, Playboy, and a slew of British magazines where Nick is the most prolific American gag cartoonist there is. He appears in multiple cartoon collections, including the complete cartoons of the New Yorker, the New Yorker Encyclopedia of Cartoons, and he showcased in all three of the ultimate cartoon books by the world's greatest cartoon cartoonist series, the Cartoon Bank is a, a big feature of him too. And he could be found there. If you want to look at more of his work, you could also go to cartoon collections. The cartoon pad welcomes our first official guest, Nick Downs. Hello, Nick. Welcome to the show. Hey, Bob. How are you? Hey, Nick, do you know uh, Michael? Sure. You guys met? Hey, Michael. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> We've never met. <laughs> I would well, recognize that face. And well, Nick, let me introduce you to our showrunner and producer, Marty. Hello. And he's, hey, Marty. How are he's you? He's the guy Good. who runs things at Weekly Humorous. Oh, yes. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for doing the show. Sure. You're our so, first guest. Yeah. We're honored well, to I'm, have you. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. We um we already introduced you with a long lavish introduction. Well, I'll have to uh, hear that sometime. It included all the different places you've been included, and all your different collections you've been in, and um, 
all your distinctions. What would you say is like one of your favorite things that that's happened to you as a cartoonist? What would like your most proudest moment? Well, I think like a lot of cartoonists, the biggest thrill is to be published anywhere. And uh, the longer you do it, the uh, better you hope the markets are that you get published in. And so, you know, there's certain kind of uh, goals, publishing goals you have. For me, it was uh, the National Lampoon, first of all, which was uh, a big deal back when I was submitting. And, um, of course, The New Yorker and uh, Playboy, Playboy magazine. I was one to get get in and... uh, that was a tough. That was a tough market to get in, but uh, um, so I. So that was a big thrill. Yeah, when you first started the New Yorker, who was the cartoon editor then? Uh, man, caught, well, when I started submitting, uh, Lee Lorenz was the editor, and I never sold a cartoon. I sold ideas to him that uh, Charles Adams ended up being the artist they assigned it the cartoons too, probably because, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed sort of dark humor and, um, I always loved Adam's work as a kid. Uh, I just, uh, was enthralled by his dark gloomy world Mm. and, and the fact that he made humor out of scary subjects. And, um, I thought that, was a great gift to to be able to make you laugh at things that normally scare us and upset us like death and uh, you know violence <laughs> no i know you're a big fan of violence see it in your work <laughs> and traffic jams yeah anything Nick- that makes us upset if you can uh if you have the ability to make that funny uh that's always a good thing. Well, it must have been thrilling to have him draw up one of your ideas. Oh, it was absolutely thrilling. I, I didn't know when I sold the idea, which, of course, like most cartoonists, you're a little miffed at first when they, you know, you get an okay and they they say, well, we'd, we'd like to buy the idea, but, you know, for someone else. And I was, you know, a little upset about that. Uh, but I did it because I figured that, was my foot in the door there. And uh, I remember I was on the subway. I was in Grand Central waiting for the four train. I, I picked up a copy of the uh, the New Yorker and uh, train arrives. I'm sitting on the train on my way back to Brooklyn and leafing through it. And uh, lo and behold, there's this beautiful Adams cartoon. And it's mine. It's my idea. And uh, I, I, I just uh, got this uh, shot of excitement through me. I, I, you know, that was the big time to me. Oh, sure. Did you correspond with Charles Adams at all? You know, um, I did. For, for a long time, I wanted to write him a, a fan letter. And uh, but I didn't want it to just be a gushing letter, you know, fan letter. But after he'd done a few of my ideas, I thought, you know, I really should write him and show how appreciative I was of, of him as an influence on me. And probably a big reason I became a cartoonist was looking at his work and being excited by what he did. And uh, I'm so glad I did because he wrote me back a wonderful letter saying, you know, he's aware of my work, he liked my stuff, uh, and coincidentally, at the moment, he was working on one of my ideas uh, for, uh, you know, for publication. And uh, and and so I, I had this sort of personal connection in, in the letter uh, from him. And uh, this was in, I think it was maybe like August of 88, and he passed away like a month later. And I thought, wow, if I had waited a lo- any longer, I never would have had this experience. I never would have had this wonderful letter um, and this this fantastic connection. And the cartoon came out, I think the cartoon came out 
after he had passed away, the, the one he was drawing when, when I, uh, you know, when he wrote me. So I'll always have that. And that, that, that's, that's a momentum that that's, I would say an answer to your question about one of the, the big thrills in my career. I think that's one of them. So Nick, I have a question. In, sure. In keeping. So when Charles was dead, you thought, well, now's my chance. <laughs> Yeah, well, just step over the body and keep keep drawing. Right. Yeah, you know, at, at I uh, I don't know. I always felt that uh, that Adams, or maybe just his kind of humor, um, sp- spoke to me a lot. Uh, I I I think as a kid, I was always very worried about you know, dying or people, you know, losing people or terrible things happening. You know, I, I, uh, when I saw that somebody, you know, an adult in the adult world was actually, um, taking on these subjects and making them funny. I, it was very empowering, you know, it's very empowering to, to be able to, uh, laugh in the face of bad things it diffused it i I, you know and i i i uh i think to this day i i'm always trying to do things work on ideas that um sort of take on things that aren't funny you know to be funny about things that aren't funny uh and in a way that's, you know, in a, the bullfighting metaphor that, uh, you know, you're a matador working close to the horns when you do that. And, you know, you risk getting gored because if it falls short, if it isn't funny, then it's just in bad taste. It's terrible. So it's, it's a challenge because you've got to really be funny if you're going to work on subjects like that. I did a cartoon. I actually sold it to the New Yorker. And uh, it was these two sort of skinny models types sitting around a a Starbucks, you know. And one says to the other, I'll always remember exactly how much I weighed on the morning of (laughs) 9-11. You know, and I, I thought, well, you know, you're taking on the sacred cow. You're taking on, you know, the most verboten subject, but I felt I pulled it off, you know? And so that it's like a double challenge. It's, it's, uh, um, you know, it's a thrill when you can actually sort of conquer a subject like that. Uh, I actually think we, we are mining in the same vein because I have quite a few cartoons like that. Yeah. My favorite being the grim reaper, talking to a woman at a party and she goes, Oh, you simply must meet my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good one. And you guys both do that where you come up with the kicker. That's unpredictable. You diffuse the tension because it comes at a left field. What you were going to say, it just surprises you. Yeah. I, I think it was Terry Southern who said, you know, that what he tries to do is not shock but to astonish. And I always felt that was what I would like to do with a cartoon. You know, you don't want to just do shocking, say shocking things, because I really don't like those cartoons and or jokes that come out immediately after some tragedy or whatever, you know, it's, it's different. It's, 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 it's hard to describe, but you know, when you, when you do it, that you've, you've somehow taken on, a subject that people normally wouldn't laugh at or even think it's funny, but you've made them laugh, you know, and uh, that still gives me a thrill when I can pull that off. I know that because like when I'm looking at your cartoons and you see me losing it and just explode with laughter, I see <laughs> a smile from you, the satisfaction you get from that. And do you feel like to accomplish what you're doing, to uh, astound and to take a, a, a dreary subject and turn it on its head. Do you do it by being unrealistic and doing something that 
you just know would not have any realism. And, and at the same time, I know that you have taught me about internal logic in a cartoon, that a cartoon should have an internal logic yeah, and not be madcap totally. Well, yeah, that, that, that to me anchors a cartoon and, and, and is what makes it funny. It, it can be a, a totally um, uh, fantastic um, scenario but if it doesn't make sense in its own crazy, the logic of that crazy situation, then to me, it doesn't work. You know, I, I really get annoyed when, when you say, even if it's a totally implausible situation, it has to have some sort of logic to it. Or I just look at that cartoon and I say, no, that, no, that, that doesn't work. That, that's, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> you know. Well, the thing, Nick, about your drawing is it's it's not so over the top that it steps on the joke. Right. So, and I notice as I, it seems like as you progress, that actually your drawings become more and more. But I I always called it like you don't wink at the joke, you you don't give it away in the drawing, you give it a you give it away in the punchline. Well, that's the. I think that's one of the hardest things for a cartoonist to develop is a style that works for your particular kind of humor. Um, you have to have a drawing style that fits the kind of humor you're you're doing. So, to have for me to have a you know a very cartoony cartoony type of style wouldn't work for my kind of humor. Uh, nor would a super realistic style. I'm, all, I'm always, I'm, I'm kind of feeling out of drawing when I set a scene for, for, a, for an idea that, that the, the effort I put into it has to, has to um, coincide with, with the joke. You know, it can't be overdone or underdone. And, and, I mean, it varies sometimes uh, from idea to idea. Um, but I think that's very important to find a style. Sometimes you'll see a style, a drawing style, that you think, this is much too illustrative for the kind of jokey gag that they're illustrating, you know? Um and vice versa. I mean, you you know, to have a to have a, a very um, kind of thought provoking uh, gag in a in a really sort of a goofy drawing style doesn't work either. So there there has to be a marriage there. Yeah. So I, I was describing your work as Hitchcockian. So <laughs> I'm wondering if you have you ever appeared in any of your cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking of the one where you're offering the young child a sedative before bed. I think I probably do uh, unconsciously appear in my cartoons, you know. That's a compliment to say Hitchcocking because I just that, that was another one of my heroes. I mean, I I remember yes. the uh, the Hitchcock hour uh this TV show that was uh when I was a kid and boy, that was that with uh, the Twilight Zone, I just loved. You know, I love these stories, and um, you know, it was a half hour actually. I guess it went to an hour, but it was. He told these great stories in half an hour, and I love that because I love the brevity of it, and and the the you know, the story of a cartoon. I think is the same way. You know, it's uh, even though it's a single panel the great ones tell a story, you know, there's a beginning, a middle and an end. You might, you might, you might have um, a freeze frame on sort of a high point of that story, but subconsciously the reader takes in the whole arc, you know, you, you imagine what kind of came before and what's going to happen next. And you internalize that when you look at it and that, and a, and a really good cartoon is able to convey that whole little drama in one frame. 
Nick, when you're working on cartoons, are you thinking that way or is it just coming out natural that way? You're breaking it down now, but do you actually realize what you're doing? Um, I think at this point, I kind of realize what I'm doing. Uh, I don't, um, I mean, I, I put a lot of time into setting a scene. I think we all realize that a cartoon is funnier when the reader sees what's happening through the eyes of someone in that cartoon instead of looking at it directly. There's something very um, human about observing an observer uh, and their reaction to this crazy thing that's happening in the, in the, in the cartoon than for us to just look at it ourselves. You know, we always want to share what we've seen. You, you can be riding down the street in a bus and see something on the sidewalk and, you know, a really unusual thing occurs. And the first thing you do is want to nudge the person next to you. It, you might not know that person, but you still want to say, hey, look, did you see that? So, I, you know, I was just I, I guess I was I was trying to um, point out that we have a tendency to look at other people's reaction to something in a cartoon as much as we look at what that observer is looking at. So um, I always make sure to have some bystander, you know, uh, observing the funny thing that's occurring. Is that sort of how all your cartoons start where you're making an observation and it becomes, it's an idea first and then the drawing, or is there a sort of set way that you work? Yeah. The idea is always first. I mean, I, you know, my, my, most of my effort comes from trying to think of a good idea. You know, the drawing is, is mechanical, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and then how best to convey that, how best to, you know, all the stuff that goes into making a good cartoon, what's extraneous, you know, what can you get, get rid of in the drawing? What can you get rid of in the caption? It's all reductive, you know, um, I mean, getting back to Alfred Hitchcock, you know, with those, those shows was, you know, to tell a, to tell a, a, a great taught dramatic story in 20 minutes or whatever it is, if you take out the commercials, you know, is, is what, you know, I mean, that's, that's what makes it work to me. You know, there's nothing extra. There's, there's no filler and a cartoon especially the kind that we do is, is all about that, you know, get in there, get out, you know, get, get the, the idea should be in the reader's head before they even know it's there, you know, and then you get this, like you, that sort of a burst of laughter, you know, cause you're surprised, you know, you're surprised yourself at, 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 at the joke. You didn't see it coming. It's interesting too, because the event hasn't happened yet but like the tension leading up to the event is happening yeah. now. So yeah. the thing that's going to happen right after your cartoon is going to be the bad thing. <laughs> so, so, you know, like the, I was the guy at uh career day, you know, he's like uh, saying, of course it was through my efforts that we landed the account, but I, that, did I get the credit? Ha, don't make me laugh. So <laughs> something bad is going to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but there's, that's the tension. And like with the, um, the co-op one where the Frankenstein they're, they're, they're storming the castle, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. yeah. So there's, you know, you're at the, you're at like kind of the tension point. You see it coming. Well, and I it, think also, I think the reader enjoys that too. I mean, that right. he, the likes suspense. Being omniscient. he likes being omniscient. He, he likes, he gets uh, he gets off on the fact that there's something right around the corner, you know, and you know it, but they don't know it. But, you know. Um, but there's also something that both of you do is that uh, not a lot, a lot of time passes in the cartoon. It's condensed down to almost a moment. Yeah. And then there's anticipation. But I, I see some cartoonists who struggle with this new cartoonists who maybe draw out the time that's passing within the cartoon. Mm. And maybe it's because it's a longer caption or there's a 
the tenses are in a way to set it up that there's a, a past, present, and future right in, in the middle of the cartoon. But I feel like your cartoons go from point A to B in the fastest possible way. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, uh, it's, it's, but you know, also it's often a cartoon, a lot of my cartoons, I think it's, it's about an attitude. It's about a, an aspect of human nature um, that you're trying to illustrate, you know, uh, whether it's greed or selfishness or, you know, uh, all the, all the, all Lust. the most, more unsavory Envy. emotions we try to hide. Uh, and I, you know, I enjoy that too, uh, to sort of, uh, so it's not necessarily something about to happen. You know, like you, you, you mentioned that father talking in front of the kids about getting screwed out of a, a job, um, or getting screwed out of a, uh, uh, a, credit. a credit for for something at the office. You know, it's the humor is more about revealing. This guy can't help but to reveal his bitterness to a, a classroom of you know seven year olds. I mean, it, you know, he's 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 really blind to his audience. You know, and he can't he can't resist you know, bitching about work to these kids who don't know what he's talking about, you know? So the, and the inappropriate, the inappropriateness is what's funny about that. Nick, do you have any um, influences now? Anybody who makes you laugh and gets you in the right mood to work? Um, people have come on the scene since, uh, since I've been doing it. I, you know, I still, my throwbacks are still people like Charles Rodriguez, uh, Brian Savage, um, Gann Wilson, Charles Adams. I, I still might pull those cartoon collections off out of my shelf to, to kind of get me going. Um, so I guess, you know, but I enjoy, I, I enjoy all cartoons and, and, and I, I like new as well as, you know, the old people, <laughs> but, uh, those yeah, most of, of my favorite cartoonists are dead. Yeah. Yeah. R- Rodriguez, uh, <laughs> is gone, but, uh, he did still, some pretty, yeah. he, he did some pretty out there stuff. He, he's probably he, still probably the farthest out uh, <laughs> of anybody. And, and I, I could, I could recall some of them now, but we're trying to <laughs> keep our, yeah. Conversation to elevate it. Well, I was thinking of uh, one of my favorite cartoons that you've done where there's this grungy garage that's open and you see the sign inside that says genius bar over the mechanic. A finishing question. Yes. A okay. final question for you, sir. Uh, I admire your, popularity with the British audience. Do you find that you need to alter your humor for the British no, audience? No, the wonderful thing is that whatever I do, uh, they appreciate, um, you know, I've never tried to um, slant it to them. I simply do my thing and, uh, you know, submit it here to uh, varying degrees of success and, uh, and over there to much greater success. Um, I, the only magazine I knew about when I started was punch and I caught the last, uh, couple of years of punch. And I thought, well, that's too bad because I was starting to get published regularly with them. And, um, the editor at the time, Michael Heath, uh, wrote me and he said, you know, I'm no longer there, but I'm over at the spectator. And, uh, I thought, well, that's, great because it's it's a weekly magazine i learned and uh took took a ton of cartoons and i was with them for you know a good 10 years or so um and then the oldie started richard ingrams who had private eye started this magazine the oldie and um i i've been with them ever since uh they started practically 
So that's about 25 years. So, so you never found the need to drop a U next to an O <laughs> in a gag line. Right. No, I would write the good old American way and they would change it. Oh, they would they, change it. If they needed to. Oh, sure. Yeah. If it's a word like color, you know, and I had spelled it my way, they'd spell it their way. <laughs> Turn hood to bonnet. They, you know, to, boot. I, to me, it was, it was very revealing that, for instance, The Spectator, which is a Tory magazine, politically very conservative, um, would take the most outre car- cartoons uh, that probably only the National Lampoon would have published, uh, whereas The New Yorker, which is politically very liberal magazine, um, has all sorts of taboos. And it was just uh, kind of ironic to me that in in the UK, if it's funny, it works. They 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 have much less squeamishness toward you know subjects that over here they they wouldn't publish. Here, everything is so money driven that they just worry about advertising. They worry about you know offending advertisers and whatnot or angry letters um and uh it's it it acts as a censorship whereas you know these magazines over there they've gone on forever and uh they really just don't pay heed to political correctness as much and so it's been great for me it's great to see you in those magazines and partly because they're the few cartoons that I can understand. Some of their humor <laughs> has references to things that go right over my head. But yeah. uh, every so often I appear in those magazines and then I see I'm um, sandwiched between two Nick Downs and I couldn't be more <laughs> delighted. I know, I also that was the dream you had last night, Bob. COVID. COVID dream. Yeah, I always like to see your work over there, Bob, too. Well, very, well very Nick, it's been great for you to appear on this show. Um, Thank it's an you. honor to have us have you as our first guest and uh I've enjoyed it very much. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Okay. Thank you, you sir. Ciao. Tra la. Um, Michael, wasn't that great having Nick come on? Nick was the best. He he frightens me, but that's good for me to be frightened. And I, you know, I learn from him when I um when I, we sit down, we work together sometimes on our batches and stuff. It's you know, he's has that insight to the inner workings of how he makes the cartoons work and stuff. And he did that again, explaining some things that are really put in a way that really make it easy to understand too. That's it for cartoon pad for this week. I want to thank all the listeners and the cartoonists out there and cartoon lovers. 11 Acorn Lane is the people to thank for our jaunty theme song. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the Cartoon Pad. And write us, if you wish, at the Cartoon Pad at weeklyhumorous.com. And stay well, stay funny, and stay six feet back. 